All right, everybody. Today we're gonna to talk about the muscular system. And first I have for you guys a list of uh, learning objectives, possibly. Oops. So some of the things that we're going to talk about today are listed here. And so hopefully by the end of this lecture, you'll be able to answer any of these that um, come across your your pathway here within the exam. So when you're studying, you should always take a look at these learning objectives and be like, can I answer these questions? So we're going to start um, talking about muscles in the context that they can only pull, they can't actually push anything. All right, so whenever we're performing a, a muscle action, our muscles, we learn in the muscle tissue section that they're contracting, so they're shortening. And that consists with the idea that they only pull, they don't actually push anything. And kind of going along with this, we're gonna classify muscles based on their functional groups um, and we do this because whatever one muscle does, the other one's going to undo. And so back in the joints lecture, if you guys remember back to the joints lecture, we talked about a lot of different movements like flexion, extension, abduction, adduction, and so on. Um, it's these muscles that are, are contracting across joints, allowing us to perform those movements. And so we're going to talk about three main functional groups of muscles. And so the first functional group that we're going to discuss are the prime movers. Okay, so um, in this example, we're going to talk about the biceps muscle. And some people use the, the term agonist. I don't really like the term agonist. Um, I'm going to use prime mover. Agonist is kind of deceptive. So the prime mover is the muscle that is most responsible for producing a movement. And so in this example over here, we're talking about flexion at the elbow. Okay, so kind of a biceps curl motion. And the major main muscle that's performing this action for us is the biceps muscle. So this is the prime mover. The antagonist is any muscle or group of muscles that are going to oppose the movement or the ones that do the opposite movement. So what's the opposite of elbow flexion? That would be elbow extension. So which muscles are going to perform elbow extension? That would be the triceps muscle, okay? Because you can see where the muscle is located. It's going to come in and it's going to attach um, at that olecranon on your ulna. And so when this muscle shortens, the forearm would come down here and straighten out. So elbow extension. So the antagonist to elbow flexion, the triceps, is, is performing extension. So it's performing the opposite of whatever the prime mover is, is performing. Synergists, <coughs> well, what is synergy, excuse me? Um, synergists, a synergy is, is working together, right? So a synergist describes all of the muscles that help the prime mover perform an action. For example, the brachioradialis muscle. The brachioradialis muscle isn't the main muscle that's doing elbow flexion, but what it is going to do, and based on its attachments, you can see here it's attached to the humerus and it's also attached um, to the radius. And so when this muscle belly shortens, it's going to bring the arm up into a biceps curl type motion, elbow flexion, but it's not, it's not the main muscle that's doing elbow flexion. It's just helping the biceps muscle do elbow flexion, all right? And so that, that's what I'm talking about by a synergist. It, it's just adding extra force to the exact same movement that the prime mover is already doing, but now synergists just help it uh, be stronger at doing that movement. 
Now, this next category I'm going to talk to you guys about, it's the, the terminology that's used around it is um, a little bit confusing. So I'm going to just read this and then I'll talk about what it means. Fixators are a type of synergist that is going to immobilize bone or a muscle's origin rather than enhancing the movement of the prime movers. And it gives the prime mover a stable base on which to act. Okay. That's kind of a confusing uh, definition, so let me just um, give this as an example to you. Up here we have rotator cuff muscles at our shoulder. And the purpose, the whole purpose in life of rotator cuff muscles is to make sure that the head of the humerus stays in the gl glenoid cavity, that socket that's on the scapula. That's their goal in life. They are considered fixators because without them holding the head of the humerus in place, we would not be able to perform elbow flexion. All right, our humerus would maybe just kind of bounce in and out here. So fixators, they give the prime mover, the, the biceps in this, in this um, example, a really stable base on which to act. Okay, so hopefully that makes more sense now. All right, so my first clicker question for you. All right, so now we can talk about how we name skeletal muscle. And to be honest, there are a lot of different factors that come into play here. So let's just go through them on, and I made this chart for you, this table, so that hopefully you can um, sort of organize it a little bit better in your mind. All right, so muscles can be named based on their location, like the temporalis muscle is located just over the temporal bone. They can be named based on their shape. Um, for example, the deltoid muscle. The word deltoid literally means triangle. The deltoid muscle happens to be triangular in shape. They can be named based on their size. So if a muscle has the term maximus in it, like gluteus maximus, um, that means it's the largest muscle of that group. So in this example, there's the gluteus maximus, medius, and minimus. Um, and so of the three gluteal muscles, the maximus is, is the largest. Um, the gluteus minimus then is the smallest. Um, and then there's an, another term here that can also describe size like longus. Uh, longus means it's a long muscle. Brevis means it's the short muscle, and I don't have that listed in here, but longus and brevis kind of go together. Um, so you're going to have a extensor uh, digitorum longus and an extensor digitorum brevis. Okay, so there's the longer version of the muscle and the shorter version of the muscle. Okay, so they might be named on their, on their um, size. They also might be named based on the direction that their fibers run. Um, so for example, the rectus muscle, their fibers are running straight. Transversus uh, fibers are running at right angles, okay? going to run at right angles. And then oblique fibers, they're actually just going to run against this imaginary defined axis. Okay, so maybe something like 
some kind of imaginary axis. Muscles might also be named on <clears throat> based on how many origins they have. So we were just talking about the biceps and the triceps muscles. So biceps is, is named um, based on its origins. It has two origins because um, bi means two and then triceps has three origins. Tri means three. Additionally, it might be named based on where they actually attached. And, and this is quite common. Um, and it actually makes learning origins and insertions a little bit easier. Um, so whenever we're naming based on location, we list the origin first in the name and the insertion second in the name. Okay, so I'm gonna give you the example of sternocleidomastoid muscle. The sternocleidomastoid muscle is going to attach to the sternum Okay, so we have sterno means sternum, uh, clido means clavicle, and then mastoid is referring to the mastoid process. All right, so you can see by breaking this word down, we can figure out that the origins are on the sternum in the clavicle, and the insertion is on the mastoid process of the temporal bone. All right, so sometimes um, this is just the way that we name skeletal muscles. It's, it's actually quite common, and it makes knowing where these muscles are located much easier once you learn the terminology. And then finally, it might, muscles might be named based on what action they're performing. So for example, they might have something like this down here, extensor carpi radialis longus. Okay, well, so an extensor is going to do ex muscle, is going to do joint extension. Okay, um, but most commonly, several of these different criteria are going to be combined. Okay, and, and, and the example that I'm going to give you here is the extensor carpi radialis longus muscle. All right, so let me just put boxes around the name of the muscle. Sensor, carpi, radialis, longus. All right, so by breaking this, this name down, we are able to figure out a lot of information about this muscle. Looking at the word extensor, so this is gonna be a muscle that's doing extension. And the word carpi means wrist. And so now we've already figured out that this is a muscle that's going to extend the wrist. And next is the word radialis. And radialis, um, as you can probably uh, guess, it has to do with the radius, right? So the thumb side. So this is going to be a wrist extender that's located on the thumb side. Um, on the radial side, and then longus um, is just referring to the length. So this is the extender of the wrist located on the radial side. That's the longest. It's going to be a, a really long muscle. Um, the sort of muscle that, that works together with this would be the extensor carpi radialis brevis, right? So there's going to be a long version of this, and there's going to be a short version of this. Um, and so it might be brevis as well. Okay, that's kind of the, the other muscle that sort of goes along with this. Okay. So all these different criteria help us to, to name muscles, skeletal muscles. So the next topic that we're going to talk about is the arrangements of fascicles. 
So if we remember back to the muscle tissue lecture, we remember that fascicles are these bundles of muscle fibers and their arrangements in the body just is going to vary. But some of the most common patterns in which they're arranged are the circular pattern, convergent pattern, fusiform, parallel, and pennant um, patterns. And we're going to talk about each of these individually. But as a whole, the fascicles or these the bundles of muscle fibers determine the range of motion of a muscle. And range of motion just means um, the amount of movement that's going to happen whenever the muscle is actually shortening, or contracting. And in addition, fascicles determine how much power the muscle has. And the, num the, the power that the muscle has is going to depend on how many muscle fibers are actually present. So when we're kind of comparing these different arrangements, these pennant, um, specifically the, the bipennant and the multipennant, um, arrangement of fascicles have the most fibers. So they're actually, they're only going to shorten a really small amount, but in that shortening, because there's so many fibers, the contraction is going to be very powerful. Alternatively, longer fibers, um, for example, like more parallel fascicle arrangements, um, they might be really long, <clears throat> so they're going to shorten more, but they're not usually as powerful of a movement. So let's talk about each of these different arrangements then. First is the circular fascicle arrangement. So the fibers here are arranged in this really circular pattern um, in, in concentric rings. And a couple of examples of muscles in the body that have fascicles arranged in a circular manner are the orbicularis oris muscle, which is located around the mouth. You can see here it's the really circular arrangement and then also the orbicularis oculi muscle which is located around our eyes um, so if you kind of look at this word orbicularis kind of sounds like orbit um, and we know something that orbits goes around um, a, a fixed point and so if you you kind of think about anything that usually set has like the word orbicularis in it um, is, is going to be arranged in that circular manner. The next arrangement are convergent um, fascicles and so all the muscle fibers here are going to converge or come together to one point and so we're gonna have a really broad origin and all of those fascicles are converging or coming together at a single point or in this case a single tendon insertion. So all of the muscle fibers here and arranged in fascicles are coming together to a point. Um, an example of this in the body is the pectoralis major muscle, which you see over here. Um, we're going to see it um, starting out this really wide origins around the, um, the sternum and the clavicle. And all of these fibers are coming together inserting at a certain point on the humerus and the deltoid muscle also kind of covers this up so the deltoid muscle has been sort of ghosted in um, so you can see where the the muscle of the pectoralis major is sort of inserting and these arrows are just representing um, basically when the pec major contracts these muscle fibers that's the direction that they're shortening so they're shortening towards you know, each other, and that's going to produce a certain movement. Okay. Next arrangements that I mentioned before are the parallel arrangements. And so the fascicles here, the, the bundles of muscle fibers, they're arranged um, along the long axis of a strap-like muscle. And the example that I'm going to give you guys here is the sartorius muscle. 
the sartorius is the longest muscle in the body. It starts up here, you can see on the uh, anterior superior iliac spine, the ASIS, and then it's gonna come and actually insert clear down um, just below the tibial tuberosity. So um, it's a very long muscle and all of the fibers are oriented into fascicles in this parallel arrangement. So running along with the, the length of the muscle. Okay. Um, so by parallel, I mean they're along the long length. If, if it was like a perpendicular arrangement, if that was a thing, the fibers would be running um, sort of in this, let's see if I can draw here. If it was like perpendicular, it would be running like the fibers and the fascicles would be running sort of this way, but they're not. Um, and so that's what I mean by, by parallel. They're running lengthwise along the long axis, sort of this way, okay? The next arrangement of fascicles that we can talk about are the fusiform. And fusiform fascicles are arranged um, sort of in this spindle shape. And so spindle shape um, usually means that there's a wider sort of cylindrical shape um, in the center that's going to taper off at the ends. Um, and the fibers are running parallel to that tapering, okay? And the example that is given for you here is the biceps muscle. Um, and so you can see that we have this um, sort of thicker cylindrical type center that is tapering off at the ends, okay? Finally, and lastly, we'll talk about the pennant arrangement. Um, <clears throat> this one's a little different because we're gonna have really short fascicles, okay? so. You, before we've seen these really long fascicles. These are really short, all right? And they're gonna run obliquely or kind of at an angle along a tendon for the entire length of the muscle. So this tendon is gonna extend the entire length of the muscle and the fascicles or the fibers, they're going to run sort of at an angle attaching to the, the tendon here. Okay, or in this case, the bipennate here, um, there will be a tendon coming right up through the middle here that these fibers are kind of coming in and attaching to. And um, here you can see the multi pennant, they're like little feathers. Okay, each little um, section looks like little feathers um, that are coming in and attaching to a single point in this case. So, again, for the uni pennant arrangement, um, the fascicles, they're attaching um, only on one side of the fascicle. Are they attaching to the central tendon, to one side of the tendon? And the example here is the extensor digitorum longus. Um, so one side of the fibers are going to attach to a tendon. And in this case, actually, the other side is going to attach directly to the tibia. The bipennant example is the rectus femoris, which is one of our quad muscles. And the fascicles here, they're inserting um, from opposite sides of the tendon. And so the tendon is actually gonna run right through the middle of this. And the fascicles, they're inserting into that tendon coming in from opposite sides. And then finally is the deltoid muscle. And the deltoid is an example of one of these multi-pennant arrangements where they look like feathers. Um, and they're actually gonna come in and insert into one tendon. In this case, that one tendon is going to insert into the humerus. Um, and so there's, there's your uh, deltoid muscle. <clears throat> so uh, moving on from kind of structure and naming and things that are being arranged certain ways, I wanna start talking about uh, sort of some of the mechanics of muscles as a whole and how they work together with bones to create movements, all right? And so essentially muscles and bones, they're working together to create these lever systems. And a lever system is gonna have three main components, and this is just in general, okay? So a lever system is going to have 
a lever, which is going to be a rigid bar. Um, in the case of the human body, the levers are almost always bones that are going to move on a fixed point. So think of like a teeter-totter sort of situation where you have a fixed point in the middle of the teeter-totter um, and then you have the part of the teeter-totter that you sit on. That would be the lever. The fixed point in the middle is called the fulcrum. And then you have each people sitting on each side of the teeter-totter, okay? The fulcrum th that we are talking about in the human body, so you have bones that are moving on a fixed point, and those fixed points are the joints. So where two bones are coming together, that would create a fulcrum or a fixed point in which those two bones can kind of move along. In addition to having a lever and a fulcrum, um, we also have effort, okay? Effort is going to be a force that is applied to a lever to move resistance, okay, or, or a load. So back to the teeter-totter example. We're, we're thinking about a teeter-totter. You're going to have one person on this side over here where it says effort. One person is going to push off the ground, which is going to move the person on the other side, the load. Okay, so the effort would be the person, oops, sorry about that, the person that's pushing off the ground, supplying energy and supplying a force to move the person on the other side, okay, the, to move the load. And in the human body, um, the, the effort um, is coming from muscle contraction. Muscles are going to contract to move bones across joints, okay? And then finally, the load refers to the resistance that's moved by the effort. So I just gave you the example of the teeter-totter and the person that's pushing off of the ground to move the other person on the other side of the teeter-totter. Um, the person on the other side of the teeter-totter is considered the load, all right? So they're the thing that's being moved by the effort. And in the human body, um, this would include uh, bone, and tissues and any other added weight that might be added um, to, to that resistance, okay? So in our discussion about, about levers, um, we have to consider a couple of things. So when we're talking about levers, levers are going to allow some given effort to either move a heavier load, and this is going to be um, the, the power levers, they're going to work to move a heavier load, or the levers are going to allow an effort to move a load farther and faster, and these are going to be our speed levers. And the ability to perform either of these actions just depends on where the fulcrum is. Um, and remember the fulcrum was that triangle shaped um, middle of the teeter-totter. So it's gonna depend on where the fulcrum is relative to where the load is and where the effort is. So let's talk about power levers. <clears throat> power levers operate at a mechanical advantage. Okay, so in the case of power levers, you're going to have a load that is close to the fulcrum and the effort being farther away from the fulcrum. Okay, so in this example, um, we have a guy who is trying to move this big rock, and so he uses a smaller rock as the fulcrum and this long stick as the bar. And so because of the way that this is arranged, um, he doesn't really need to provide a lot of effort to move this really large load. Instead, he only has to uh, supply a small amount of effort to move this large load. This is much more mechanically advantageous than him coming over here and trying to physically pick up this giant rock and move the load. 
right? So you can use, he uses this lever system to move the load. The disadvantage to this is that by using this lever system, you can't move this load very far, okay? You can only move it a short distance. In contrast, speed levers, um, speed levers are unlike power levers because we just said power levers have a mechanical advantage. Speed levers have a mechanical disadvantage. Okay, and so in this case, the load is farther away from the fulcrum than the effort. Okay, so we're going to give the example of the, the acrobat. Okay, so we have an acrobat over here, um, and the effort is being supplied on this side. And as you can see, because of the placement of the fulcrum being closer to the effort this time, when he jumps down, you can imagine she's gonna go flying into the air, okay? So because of this arrangement, the load is going to be moved really quickly over a very far distance. This is gonna provide a wide range of motion. The unfortunate part or the disadvantage of this is that in order to move this load, in order to move her, the effort, that's being applied has to be greater than whatever the load is. So if this were a small child trying to apply this effort, she wouldn't go flying, right? The, the child wouldn't have enough effort to overcome the weight of the load, okay? So hopefully that uh, makes sense. And as we continue this conversation, we're going to talk about some ways in which we classify these lever systems. All right. And we have three major classes. We have first, second, and third class levers. And they're classed based on the relative position of where is the effort, where is the fulcrum, and where is the load. Right, and there's different arrangements, and so I'm going to go through each one of these, and hopefully by the end, um, this all makes sense. It's very physics-y. I'm sorry for that, but hopefully if I can apply it to um, real-life context, we can kind of understand the interactions that are happening here. All right, so first class levers. This is like your teeter-totter example. I'm going to give you a different example um, for this particular case, just so you have a, more than one example in your mind. Okay, so for first class levers, the fulcrum is between the load and the effort. Now, depending on where the fulcrum is, this can be either a power lever or a speed lever. So uh, kind of going back to our examples that I gave earlier, the, the man moving the big rock, if the fulcrum was over here, closer to the load, that would provide mechanical advantage for moving this load, okay? So then it would be a, a power lever. Alternatively, to the example with the acrobat, if we put the fulcrum closer to the effort, then this can be a speed lever, okay? The only important thing about making sure that the first class lever is first class levers have the fulcrum at some point between the load and the effort, okay? Fulcrum's always in the middle. So it goes load, fulcrum, effort. An everyday example of this would be, um, well, the teeter-totter, but the other example that I'm gonna give you here are scissors. <clears throat> so the load in this case is gonna be whatever you're trying to cut through. The fulcrum is the point where the two blades, the scissors are crossing. All right, so there's always that screw right there in the middle of the scissors. Um, that'd be the fulcrum. And then the effort is going to be you uh, squeezing your fingers to get these two handles to come together, which is going to then cut the load. Okay, so this is the first class lever. In the body, the first class lever um, example that I'm gonna give you is you tilting your head backwards. So you're um, looking straight and you decide that you're going to 
tilt your head back and look up at the sky or look up at the ceiling. The load in this case is going to be the weight of the head. Okay. The fulcrum is going to be the point um, in between the load and the effort. So the fulcrum is going to be the atlanto-occipital joint, right? So the occipital bone, um, the base of the skull, working against the uh, C1 atlas. Okay, that joint there is considered our fulcrum because remember in the human body, fulcrums are joints. Um, and then the effort, um, and, and if you remember back, I said effort is uh, in the human body, the force um, that we get when muscle contracts and so has something to do with muscles, right? And so the effort here is being provided by the neck muscles that are on um, the posterior neck, okay? So as these muscles shorten, our head moves along this fixed point back and up towards the ceiling, okay? So hopefully you guys understand first class levers because now we're gonna talk about second class levers. All right, so we have a different arrangement here. So <clears throat> in second class levers, the lever is set up so that we have the fulcrum, load, and then the effort, okay? So in this case, the load is in the middle. The load is between the fulcrum and the effort. And remember back to first class levers, first class levers had the fulcrum in the middle in between the load and the effort. Second class levers have the load in the middle between the fulcrum and the effort, okay? These levers are ideal for small, powerful movements, all right? So an everyday example of a second class lever would be a wheelbarrow. So in this case, the fulcrum is going to be the wheel of the wheelbarrow. The load is whatever is inside of the wheelbarrow that you're trying to move. And the effort is going to be you pulling up on the handlebars to move the wheelbarrow, okay? Anatomical example, so in the human body, what's an example of a second class lever? Um, standing on your tiptoes is an example of a, sec of a second class lever. So in this case, the load is gonna be the weight of your body. The fulcrum is going to be the joint that's located at the ball of the foot. And the effort here is being applied by calf muscles, which pull upwards on the heel, okay? So we have fulcrum load effort, okay? In terms of its arrangement. The load in second class levers is between the fulcrum and the effort, okay? Finally, third class levers um, have, again, a different arrangement. So in this case, in, in third class levers, the effort is going to be in the middle between the load and the fulcrum. So the arrangement here goes load, effort, fulcrum, okay? This is ideal for fast, large movements, All right? So a everyday example of this is, um, we can give you the example of tweezers or, or forceps, whatever you wanna call them. The load here is whatever you're picking up with the tweezers. The fulcrum is going to be where the tweezers are welded together um, on sort of the closed end of the tweezers. And then the effort is going to have to be applied um, right here in the middle of the tweezers so that you can push the tips of the tweezers together by pinching the middle of the tweezers. Okay, so you have to apply effort in the middle of this lever system in order to achieve the um, outcome that you want. In the human body, an example of this um, is flexing the uh, elbow joint or flexing the forearm by the biceps brachii muscle. Okay, so doing bicep curls is the easy way to put this. In this case, the load is actually going to be the hand, the distal forearm, and well, in the case of biceps curls, however much weight is actually in your hand, but you can do this without a weight. You still have a load, even if there's not a weight there, because the load then is just the weight of your hand and your distal forearm. The fulcrum here is gonna be our elbow joint. 
Um, and you can see in between the load and the fulcrum, we have this insertion of the biceps muscle, which is going to be located between the load and the fulcrum. And the effort here is going to be as the bicep is contracting, it exerts a force on the more proximal radius. Okay, and that's going to allow you to move the load up towards the shoulder in a true biceps curl fashion. Okay, so that is um, the three major classes of levers. And I think I have a quick question for you next. Okay, so we are done with most of the hard stuff um, and we're going to move on to talking about specific muscles in the body. And the human body has more than 600 skeletal muscles, named skeletal muscles. And these muscles, they tend to be grouped based on their location and their functions. Um, in lab, we're going to learn a ton of these muscles, but for lecture, I'm going to try to keep it a little bit simpler. Um, and so for lecture, we're going to identify some principal muscles, so about 125 pairs of them. Um, and although this number is, is a lot less than 600, the job of learning all these muscles still requires a concerted effort on your part. Okay, so you really need to work at this. It's very important um, <clears throat> to be able to locate, identify different muscles of the body. Okay, so what do you need to know? Well, for lab, I'm going to have you guys identify muscles and know certain features about the muscles, such as its origin, insertion, action, innervation, those things. Now for lecture, I'm going to have you identify muscles based on figure 10.4 and 10.5, which will be coming up in a couple of slides. And then I'm going to ask you to know um, more detail about certain muscle groups. And those muscle groups I'm going to ask you to know a little bit more detail about are the rotator cuff muscles, respiratory muscles, quads, and hamstrings. Okay. Here I give you some tips for learning muscles um, because this tends to be overwhelming for students um, at first glance, but I promise it, it's not as hard as what you think it's going to be. I know I just said 125 pairs of muscles. That's intimidating. However, here are some tips to make that a little bit easier. First tip, be aware of what you can learn from that muscle's name. So remember earlier when I was talking about naming skeletal muscles, I gave you the example of uh, extensor carpi radialis longus. What can you learn from that muscle's name? All right, remember we broke that down. Extensor means it extends. Carpi refers to the wrist, so this is a wrist extensor. Radialis, that means it's on the thumb side. Uh, longus, meaning it's the longer muscle. Okay, so you can learn a lot just from the name of the muscle. Additionally, um, another tip here is to read the description um, that's given in the tables that I provide you and identify muscles on a figure. Okay, and so I'm going to give you blank figures as well. This helps you to relate the location to the description. And also you can relate the location of the muscle and where the muscle is attaching to its actions. So if you remember back, um, think about that biceps picture, we saw it inserting up into the shoulder and then we also saw it inserting onto the radius. And so if you think about what's happening when, when that muscle is shortening, which during contraction muscles shorten, so during contraction that's going to bring your forearm closer to your shoulder. Right? And so just by understanding and, and kind of thinking about looking at where is it attached, okay, based on those attachments, if that muscle shortens, what's it going to do? It's going to do elbow flexion, right? You can come to a, a pretty good conclusion about the actions of a muscle um, just by, by looking at its attachments. 
And then fourth, um, and, and this part is, is very important actually, um, act out those movements on yourself. And as you're acting out those movements, feel, put your hand on your skin and feel for muscles contracting beneath the skin, right? This is gonna help relate to um, this information that you're learning, which might seem just like a lot of words, to a kinesthetic sense of feel and touch and understanding. I don't want you guys to memorize. I want you to understand. All right, so here are some tips just to help you to help you do that. Now, I did just mention um, a couple of slides ago that for lab, I'm gonna have you know things like origin insertion, action innervation. And so to better understand this, I need you guys to understand what origin and insertion are. So if you recall from the joints chapter, um, most skeletal muscles are going to span across joints and attach to bones or other structures in at least two places, which is how we can actually move our joints, right? Therefore, the overall purpose of muscles. Those two or more places where the muscles are attaching to the bones or other structures um, are called the origin and the insertion. The origin is the attachment of a muscle that's going to remain relatively fixed during contraction. The insertion is going to be the movable attachment of a muscle. And this sounds kind of confusing, but I'll make it easier in one second, I promise. So when I'm, I'm gonna give you the example over here of the brachialis muscle. And the brachialis muscle is located just beneath the biceps muscle. So, the origin of the brachialis muscle is going to be on the distal anterior humerus. The distal meaning closer to the elbow, uh, anterior is front side of the body, and the humerus. So the lower part of the humerus on the front of the body. The insertion of the brachialis muscle is going to be on the coronoid process and the ulnar tuberosity. These are important because when a muscle contracts, remember the origin is the attachment that remains relatively fixed or basically the attachment that doesn't move when it contracts. And then the insert would be the part of the muscle that is going to move when the muscle contracts. So, when a muscle contracts, the movable bone, therefore the muscle's insertion, is going to move towards the less movable bone, which would be the origin. Okay, so the brachialis muscle, when it contracts, is going to move the forearm up towards the humerus for elbow flexion. Okay, this one's a synergist to the biceps muscle. So you can understand then that the, the humerus itself, the upper arm, isn't moving whenever you flex your elbow, right? The humerus, the upper arm stays in place. It's your wrist, it's your forearm, actually rather, your forearm that's actually moving whenever you're doing a biceps curl. Therefore, it is the insertion that's actually doing the moving, okay? So hopefully that makes sense. Um, and if it doesn't, then there's some really good YouTube videos out there that uh, can help explain this. <clears throat> All right, so um, on that slide, maybe two slides ago, three, sli three slides ago, um, I told you that for lecture, you'll have to identify some um, superficial muscles of the body, the ones that are located in figure 10-4 and 10-5. Um, this is figure 10-4 and 10-5. Okay, so these are the superficial muscles on the front side of the body and superficial muscles on the back side of the body. And so on the exam, um, I'm just going to pick a few of these randomly and ask you to identify them um, based on this figure. And that's why I gave you this picture. Um, and I'll put this in a PDF format that you guys can print out and practice labeling if you so choose to do so. 
And in addition to knowing those superficial muscles, I asked you, or I told you, that there are certain groups of muscles that I'm gonna have you pay special attention to. And we're gonna start those muscles here with the rotator cuff muscles. Rotator cuff muscles, they act as synergists and fixators. So remember back to the beginning of lecture, I told you that, um, I gave you the example that the rotator cuff muscles were the fixators. They're the ones that help to keep the head of the humerus in that glenoid cavity on the scapula. It helps to hold the humerus in place. Um, and so as far as the rotator cuff muscles go, all of them originate on the scapula. Okay, scapula would be the non-movable bone here. Their whole purpose in life for the rotator cuff muscles then is just to reinforce the shoulder capsule, okay? To, to make sure that the head of the humerus stays up against the scapula, okay? That's, that's their whole job in life. Keep that shoulder in socket. These muscles um, include what we, they give the acronym of SITS. Um, so supraspinatus, infraspinatus, teres minor, um, and this is all posterior side and anterior side, the subscapularis. So if you remember back to when we were learning about bones in, in lab, we had the supraspinous fossa, infraspinous fossa, and subscapular fossa. And I told you in lab that these are going to be places that muscles sit in. So as you can see, the rotator cuff muscles, again, include the supraspinatus, which is sitting in the supraspinous fossa. The infraspinatus, which is sitting in the infraspinous fossa, the subscapularis, which is sitting in the subscapular fossa, um, and then finally this teres minor, okay, which is going to um, come sort of from the lateral angle of the scapula and go in and attach to the humerus. So here's the description that I have of the rotator cuff muscles. Um, here's just a table that you guys can uh, look at. You can see um, the subscap is going to rotate uh, the arm medially. Um, supraspinatus is going to start abducting the arm. Infraspinatus is going to laterally rotate the arm, and then the teres minor has the exact same action as the infraspinatus, which makes sense because they're sitting right next to each other. So I just wanted to show you guys a couple of videos there. Um, and I'll do that for the next uh, couple of slides, show you just some, some different videos. That hopefully wasn't too tricky. <laughs> All right, so the next group of muscles that I want to talk to you guys about are the respiratory muscles. Um, and so whenever we breathe, we actually have two different phases. So we have inspiration is when we inhale air um, and we have expiration when we exhale air. So if you just take a second to breathe in, you can feel your chest cavity expanding and it's, it's getting bigger. And then as you exhale, your chest cavity gets much smaller. We have muscles that help us do this. Okay, so the inspiratory muscles that are helping us to do this include the diaphragm, okay, the diaphragm, and this is our primary inspiratory muscle, and the, the diaphragm um, also serves the purpose of separating the thoracic cavity from the abdominal cavity. 
So whenever we inhale, the diaphragm contracts, moves downwards towards the abdominal cavity, which makes more space in the thoracic cavity. As we relax, the diaphragm is going to relax and its relaxed position is up in this um, sort of crescent shaped uh, form. And as you can see, that makes the size of the chest cavity smaller. In addition to the diaphragm, the other muscles that help us to inhale are the external intercostal muscles. Okay, so that's this picture here, the external intercostal muscles. Um, and fiber direction is important here. If you look at the way that the fibers are running, okay, so I'm just gonna draw a couple of them on here. They are running like this. All of these muscles in between the ribs here are the external intercostal muscles. Okay, so external intercostal muscles are running from the lateral side of the top rib medially towards the bottom rib or the rib right underneath of it. So when this contracts, the rib cage, so as this shortens, it shortens and it shortens. It's actually going to pull the rib cage. I'm going to go back to this top picture here. It's going to pull the rib cage up and sort of laterally, up and sort of out. Okay, and that again helps to make space for the lungs to fill up with air. Alternatively, whenever we exhale, just normal breathing exhalation is a result of our inspiratory muscles relaxing. So the diaphragm relaxing, the external intercostal muscles relaxing, okay? <clears throat> However, if I were to say, breathe out, keep breathing, and then push every little bit of air in your lungs out, give me that extra exhalation, any, any little bit that you can get out. That's called forced expiration, okay? And forced expiration is going to gain its action due to internal intercostals, all right? Notice fiber direction of internal intercostals. They're running oppositely to the external intercostals. And because of this, this is going to pull the ribs sort of downward and tighten them up, okay? This forced expiration only requires the internal intercostals. Um, and they're named external intercostals and internal intercostals because the external intercostals are on the outside and if you cut away these external intercostals, there you would find the internal intercostal muscles, okay? So, clear my drawings here. Here is the table for the respiratory muscles, um, giving the description, origin, insertion, action, and nerve supply. Here's a couple of videos for you.
Okay, so the next muscle group that we're going to talk about then is the quadriceps femoris muscles. And fun fact, these are the most powerful muscles in the body. They arise from four separate heads that form the flesh in the front and also on the sides of the thigh. And all four insert into the quadriceps tendon, which then inserts into the patella. So I'm going to kind of pull this here together. So quadriceps, quad, quad, all of them are going to insert into the um, this tendon, which is then going to insert into the patella, which then is going to insert via the patellar ligament onto the tibial tuberosity. So this is a powerful knee extender. So if you start with your knee bent and you straighten it back out, that is your quads muscles doing that. <clears throat> and the muscles here that make up the quadriceps femoris muscle group include the erectus femoris, which is the one on the top and the very center, the vastus lateralis, which is on the lateral side of the leg, the vastus medialis, which is on the medial side of the leg. And if I cut the um, quad tendon here and I pulled the rectus femoris out of the way, just beneath the rectus femoris, you'll see this vastus intermedius. And apparently my vastus lateralis is not working, so hold on one second. All right, so I got my video working, and here we go. Vastus lateralis is the lateral member of the muscle group of the anterior thigh known as the quadriceps femoris. The origins of vastus lateralis are from the greater trochanter, the intertrochanteric line, and the lateral lip of the linea aspera of the femur. The fibers run inferiorly to insert onto the quadriceps femoris tendon, the superior and lateral borders of the patella, and to the tibial tuberosity via the patellar ligament. The vastus lateralis extends the leg at the knee. It is innervated by the femoral nerve. And here's vastus medialis. Vastus medialis is the medial member of the muscle group of the anterior thigh, known as the quadriceps femoris. The origins of vastus medialis are from the intertrochanteric line of the anterior medial femur, from the linea aspera and the medial supracondylar line of the posterior femur. The fibers run inferiorly to insert onto the quadriceps femoris tendon, the superior and medial borders of the patella, and to the tibial tuberosity via the patellar ligament. The vastus medialis extends the leg at the knee. It is innervated by the femoral nerve. And finally, the vastus intermedius. 
Vastus intermedius is the intermediate and deep member of the muscle group of the anterior thigh, known as the quadriceps femoris. The origins of vastus intermedius are from the anterior and lateral surfaces of the shaft of the femur. The fibers run inferiorly to insert onto the deep part of the superior border of the patella and to the tibial tuberosity via the patellar ligament. The vastus intermedius extends the leg at the knee. It is innervated by the femoral nerve. All right, so that finishes up with the quadriceps femoris muscles. Um, again, here is the table um, that I give you that has the description, origin insertion, action, and innervation of the four quadriceps femoris muscles. And um, I believe this is lastly, we're going to move on to the hamstrings muscles. And these are the fleshy muscles of the posterior thigh, of the, excuse me, posterior thigh. And they are special in that they cross both the hip and the knee joints. So these ones are the prime movers of thigh extension and knee flexion. So thigh extension, you're bringing your whole leg back um, and then knee, ex ex uh, knee flexion is um, you're bending your knee. All of these muscles are innervated by the sciatic nerve. And a really common um, sports injury that uh, a lot of athletes suffer from is a pulled hamstring. Um, and so a lot of times athletes especially have just very tight hamstrings. And so overstretching of these muscles um, would result in a, a pulled hamstring. And so the muscles here include the biceps femoris. Um, and it has uh, biceps means two heads. And so it has both a long head and a shorter head. Um, in addition, we have the semitendinosus. And the semitendinosus um, has this really, really long tendon. Okay, so that's how I remember tendinosis. It's got this really long, skinny tendon, um, and it is inserting on the medial side of the posterior leg. And then finally is the semimembranosis, um, which you see medial side over here. Um, and it's also deep to the tendon of the tendinosis. Okay, so the membranosis um, is, is this muscle here still as well. Okay. So now I can play for you the um, videos that go with the hamstrings muscles. The biceps femoris. Biceps femoris is the lateral member of the muscle group located in the posterior thigh known as the hamstrings. Biceps femoris has two heads, the long head and the short head. The origin of the long head is by a common tendon with a semitendinosus from the superior and medial surfaces of the ischial tuberosity. The origins of the short head are from the lateral lip of the linea aspera and the lateral supracondylar line of the femur. The fibers run inferiorly and laterally to insert primarily onto the lateral surface of the fibular head, but it also inserts on the adjacent surface of the lateral condyle of the tibia. Both heads of the biceps femoris flex the leg at the knee and laterally rotate the knee. The long head also extends the thigh at the hip. The long head is innervated by the tibial nerve. The short head is innervated by the common fibular nerve. Okay, and now we have semitendinosus. Semitendinosus lies posterior to semimembranosus 
and is the most superficial member of the muscle group located in the posterior thigh known as the hamstrings. The origins of semitendinosus are by a common tendon with the long head of the biceps femoris from the superior and lateral surfaces of the ischial tuberosity. The fibers run inferiorly to insert onto the medial surface of the proximal tibia. Semitendinosus extends the thigh at the hip. and flexes the leg at the knee. It also medially rotates the knee during flexion. Semitendinosus is innervated by the tibial nerve. Semimembranosus is the medial member of the muscle group located in the posterior thigh known as the hamstrings. The origins of semimembranosus are from the superior and lateral surfaces of the ischial tuberosity. The fibers run inferiorly to insert onto the posterior surface of the medial condyle of the tibia. Semimembranosus extends the thigh at the hip and flexes the leg at the knee. It also medially rotates the knee during flexion. Semimembranosus is innervated by the tibial nerve. And so finally, um, here is the table for the hamstring muscles, giving the list of the three hamstring muscles, descriptions of those muscles, origins, insertions, actions, and their nerve supplies. Um, and that is all I have for you today for this lecture. And so if you have any questions, feel free to email me um, or shoot me a message on um, Remind, if you're part of the Remind app, um, or Signal Vine. And other than that, um, we are done for the day.